Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. My guest today is Dan Kovalik. Dan t- teaches international human rights law at the University of Pittsburgh and is the author of a number of books, including The Plot to Attack Iran, How the CIA and the Deep State Have Conspired to Vilify Iran, and the soon-to-be-released The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, How the U.S. is Orchestrating a Coup for Oil. So welcome to Wider View, Dan. Thank you. So it seems that the U.S. government is preparing for two wars at once, or at least two, uh, one against Iran and another against Venezuela. So maybe we can begin with uh, Iran. The International Crisis Group notes that in the past few weeks, the Trump administration has doubled down on its efforts to strangle Iran's economy, is now pushing to reduce Iran's oil exports to zero, has designated the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization, has began deploying warships and jets to the Middle East to counter unspecified threats. Why is the Trump administration so eager to start a war with Iran? Well, it's a good question. Um, You really have to go back to 1979 when uh, the Iranian people overthrew the U.S.-backed Shah of Iran, who was uh, really the most brutal dictator in the world at that time. In fact, Amnesty International had found in 1978 that Iran had the very worst human rights record in the world. And um, the U.S. has never forgiven Iran for overthrowing the Shah, who, of course, the U.S. put in power in 1953. And help bolster uh, up until his ouster in, in 1979. And uh, the U.S. has been trying to get rid of the uh, revolutionary government since that time. Uh, one has to recall that, for example, the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran, which led to an eight-year war between those two countries, which was quite brutal in which a million people in total died, in which Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Iran and against his own people, the Kurds at the time. These were chemical weapons he obtained uh, from the United States and Germany. And um, even after the war, the U.S. has, you know, uh, imposed sanctions, supported terrorist groups like the MEK, which has killed 17,000 people in Iran, over the years to try to destabilize that country. So we've seen, you know, for many years, this attempt to undermine uh, and and overthrow the government in Tehran. But this is really uh, the momentum for this has really accelerated in recent years with the appointment of John Bolton as Trump's national security advisor. Bolton has been Bolton is a neocon. He is, uh, for years, been open about wanting to overthrow the Iranian government. He has given presentations to MEK's uh, conventions uh, in which he's talked about this. And he, it's very clear, he is one of the big moving forces right now in trying to overthrow the government in Iran. It's it's certainly very much against what Trump at least said on the campaign trail. Uh, although Trump was always against the Iran nuclear deal, um, it seemed, uh, at least to me, that he primarily was opposed to it because it was Obama's thing. Yes, well, it is interesting. Yeah, I mean, Trump is an interesting character because, as you say, he – on the campaign trail was very critical of these wars that the U.S. has been fighting, particularly in the Middle East, has questioned their utility, um, which was certainly welcome. Um, But, you know, he's very erratic and, you know, clearly is a guy that lacks a lot of principle. Uh, Of course, once he appointed Bolton, you know, this itself was a huge move on his part, which showed he was going back to the neocon, you know, movement for his foreign policy. Um, uh, so it's very interesting. And um, he's been very 
influenced by Bolton, who again wants to push this uh, forward, and of course by Netanyahu in Israel, who also is very aggressive against Iran and I think has been very influential on the White House in pushing Mm -hmm. uh, a conflict with that country. So it's a very dangerous time. I mean, I saw that, you know, there are plans of possibly sending 120,000 U.S. troops to the Persian Gulf to prepare for this war, uh, which – you know, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who actually wrote the yellow cake speech for Colin Powell, which helped pave the way for the invasion of Iraq in 2003. He's been very open about a couple things. One, that he regrets having written that, which he admits was fraudulent and um, got us into a war, which has been devastating. And uh, which he now opposes, and he does not want a similar war in Iran. And what he has said, and I think he's correct, that a war with Iran will be ten times more costly in lives and treasure than the war in Iraq, which is an incredible statement. I mean, that you're talking about tens of millions dead, talking about many trillions of dollars spent. This would be a, a, a disaster, uh, obviously, first and foremost, for the Iranian people. But also for the region in the United States, I mean, the U.S. could not continue to spend ourselves into bankruptcy on war, which is exactly what we've been doing. We've already right. spent six trillion dollars on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, this just cannot go on this way. And again, Trump alluded to that fact, you know, when he was running for president. But he seems to have now. Uh, uh, turned his back on, on mm-hmm. some of those ideas. One of the parallels between the Iraq and Iran um, buildups to war here is the fact of sanctions. Um, there was an article recently on uh, low blog by uh, Elam Portar who, who says that the war has already begun from the perspective of the Iranian people saying that sanctions are in fact a war waged by the United States against the Iranian working and middle classes. Um, And it seems that sanctions are this administration's preferred tool to bash any country that dares to oppose U.S. hegemony on any, any front. What is the status of these unilateral sanctions under international law? I mean, is this is this what what is going on here from a legal perspective? Yes, well, these sanctions are unlawful. You know, the UN Charter is very clear that states are not supposed to take unilateral actions against other states um, unless there's been an armed attack. I mean, that's the only exception to that. Otherwise, countries are supposed to go to the Security Council to impose sanctions or to wage war. And, of course, the U.S. hasn't done that. It rarely does that. Um, In the case of sanctions, it almost never does that. It did do that in the 90s with Iraq, you might recall. did get Security Council authorization for those sanctions. And those sanctions killed a million people, Mm -hmm. including 500,000 children. And there's that famous quote by um, the Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, who was asked about the death of those 500,000 children. And the question was, you know, was it worth it? And she said yes. Mm -hmm. Um, So these sanctions can kill more people uh, than than bullets, and we have to, to realize that. And again, to do it unilaterally in the way the U.S. is doing it against Iran, against Venezuela is unlawful, and it's deadly. In the case of Venezuela, for example, Jeffrey Sachs, a very well-respected economist out of Columbia University, just co-authored a report estimating that since August of 2017 alone, over 40,000 Venezuelans have died due to the U.S. sanctions because of the inability of Venezuela to buy food, to buy various medicines, including HIV medicines, cancer medicines, uh, diabetes uh, uh, medicines. 
and in in Iran right now, we're we're imposing further sanctions, which which are are killing people as well. It, we, you know, we know that Iran is having trouble getting medicine and raw material to make medicine because of these sanctions. You know, this is just uh, causing human misery in these countries. Um, and the sad thing is, a lot of human rights groups really don't. They're not critical. Uh, of the sanctions, they see sanctions as somehow a peaceful means of of uh, carrying out you know political agendas. But they're it's they're not peaceful. They're 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 violent. Mm-hmm. And as you say, I mean they're they're completely illegal under international law. I mean the only mistaken only the Security Council has the authority actually to impose sanctions. That's right. Uh, yeah. So another target of sanctions and, uh, and regime change operations, although um, perhaps at this point not successfully, is Venezuela. You recently wrote, a, wrote an article um, on Counterpunch uh, that pointed out that the um, U.S. press is completely unanimous in uh, supporting uh, the coup in Venezuela including, you know, completely false reports, um, you know, all sorts of uncritical uh, look at this, um, at this coup. And what accounts for this, do you think, in the part of the press? And why are we not hearing uh, about what's really going on in Venezuela? Yes. So as I pointed out, there is this uh, good report by Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR, she did a study over three months of the, you know, prominent news services in the U.S. and found not one opinion piece opposing U.S. intervention in Venezuela and found that 54 percent of the opinion pieces were directly in support of intervention in Venezuela. And what accounts for this unanimity? I mean, the press in the U.S. has always been you know, very much uh, supportive of war. And lies that lead to war, for example, the weapons of mass destruction that we were told were in Iraq, which which weren't in Iraq. And the press really pushed uh, that lie hard, pushed the Gulf of Tonkin lie, uh, which got us uh, deeper into Vietnam. Uh, And we can go down the line. Why this is, uh, I think there's a lot of. Uh, different reasons for that one is because, you know, the press is largely captured by corporations which have an interest in war. That's mm-hmm. part of it. I think there is a, a, a real cultural issue in the United States where just in general, the, you know, elite intellectuals so-called are unwilling to challenge the U.S. when it comes to foreign policy, there, there's this almost blind faith in U.S. foreign policy is somehow a, a promoter of good in the world, promoter of democracy and human rights, even though there's absolutely no evidence that that's true. And I think that's a big part of it. And some of its laziness, thriftiness, that is to say that, you know, it's expensive to send journalists to places like Iran um, or Venezuela and so you rarely get reportage out of that country, out of those countries. You know, it's very interesting. You'll mm-hmm. hear a report on Iran from a reporter in Beirut, for example. That's very common. Or from Cairo, you know, because they don't send people everywhere um, to save money, but also they're lazy. And so it's just as easy to report to give the State Department line as as fact rather than actually go and, just, you know, investigate whether it is factual. And so you have a combination of things which leads to a press, which really is very dogmatically in favor of, of U.S. war machinations. Um, and I think that's that's gotten worse over the years. I mean, you just don't hear the other side of these issues. And, and people who try to raise the other side of these issues, like Tulsi Gabbard, for example, congresswoman from Hawaii, mm-hmm. You know, she's absolutely pilloried for questioning what the U.S. is doing around the world. And it's sad and it's frustrating. You're listening to Dan Kavalik, who teaches international human rights law at the University of Pittsburgh and is an author of a number of books on U.S. interventionism. 
This is wider view. Yeah, and I think also, uh, you know, you, you touched on this, uh, but this is this is a, a long-standing uh, situation here with our country. I mean, we we talked last week on this program, featured a speech by Hassan Nasrallah, the uh, Secretary General of Hezbollah, who concluded by saying, um, quote, the United States does not negotiate, they just impose their conditions and give ultimatums. And, you know, he was referring particularly to Trump, Bolton, and Pompeo, but I don't think it, you know, this this seems like standard U.S. practice to me. It's been a long time, at least, since the United States has actually negotiated in the truest sense of the word. Would you agree? Well, yes. Yes. And I think this is about imperial hubris. You know, the U.S. sees itself as the sole superpower and then and therefore feels it doesn't have to negotiate. Uh, with anyone. And also, you know, the U.S. puts all of its money into its military might. You know, we spend around a trillion dollars a year in building up our military. And essentially, when you're a hammer, everything, every problem looks like a nail, right? Mm -hmm. um, as Noam Chomsky in, in notes, you know, the U.S. doesn't put any effort or money into its diplomatic core. It's all about the military. And so that's its strength, and that's what it always plays to. Uh, and then, you know, you have countries like Norway, for example, who have virtually no military, but they're very good in the field. That's where they're strong. And, and, and um, But the U.S. doesn't value that. They do think they can rule the world by force is what it comes down to. And uh, that's what they're trying to do. You know, it does find for me this... It's like an utter disregard for international law. I know that's your specialization. Um, and this country uh, was at least partially, if not primarily, responsible for the development of a lot of the human rights law that we have uh, right after the Second World War. Um, but now, you know, there's just... Uh, our government talks about the rule of law, but what they really mean is the rule of you obey us and might makes right. Do you think we're, do you think that we, there's a potential for returning to some sort of uh, respect for international law again? Um, or are we just going to be continuing down the path we're going now? I'd like to say that there's a chance, and obviously there's always a chance, and we need to be hopeful, and we need to push for the U.S. to follow the rule of law. But in the near future, I, I don't see it likely that the U.S. will do so. I mean, you know, we have to look at the various uh, things the U.S. has and has not been doing over many years in Democratic and Republican administrations. You know, the U.S., while it will often argue that various leaders should be referred to the International Criminal Court, the U.S. itself is not a signatory to the Internet Rome statute on the International Criminal Court. We believe that, the, that things like uh, the International Criminal Court simply have no power over the U.S. The U.S. just backed out of also all um, general jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, which is the highest court in the world also known as the World Court. Because the U.S. lost a case to Iran recently where Iran uh, challenged U.S. sanctions against it, um, the U.S. said, well, okay, well, we're just not going to be subject to the World Court anymore. Uh, and this is what the U.S. does. I mean, the U.S. just really believes that international law applies to everyone else but itself. And uh, obviously you can't have a legal regime where that's the case, where it applies only to the weak and not the strong. And that really is what this is about. The U.S. thinks it, it's too strong to be subject to international law. And so it just uh, really has opted itself out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just not what people of, of, you know, who believe in fairness and morality and, again, le legality should, should accept. It's, um, but that, that's where we're at. On another note, I guess, because now we're turning sort of inward because we're, we begin talking about how our own country is governed. Um, 
you published a book last fall entitled the, uh, the Plot to Control the World, How the U.S. Spent Billions to Change the Outcome of Elections Around the World. And we've uh, talked about that a lot on this particular program, the machinations of the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID, uh, along with the CIA and others, uh, to influence elections. And there are some writers now, uh, including former CIA agent Larry Johnson, who wrote on Consortium News recently, claiming that the FBI and the CIA are using a lot of the same techniques um, or used a lot of the same techniques in the 2016 elections in an de de attempt to defeat Trump um, and then undermine him after the elections. Uh, I think he's speaking primarily of the Russiagate um, uh, situation. Have you read any of those stories, and uh, would you agree with them? Well, yes, yes, and I, I do agree with them. Clearly, the Russiagate issue uh, which, by the way, I wrote a book on that as well. That was my first book, actually, um, <laughs> called The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. You know, the Russiagate issue has been used as a hammer uh, against Trump uh, since before he was even elected, but certainly since he was elected as well. Um, and again, really, in my view and in the view of a lot of folks, to really temper his best inclinations, that is, those inclinations – that were to be against war in confrontation with countries like Russia. Mm -hmm. And that was anathema to uh, the ruling elite, including in the Democratic Party. And so, you know, there's been this constant uh, water torture, you know, against the Trump administration for anything it does to be friendly, uh, not only with Russia, but with other countries as well, like North Korea. And it's quite, there's a certain irony, of course, because, you know, no, you know, very few people would see Trump as some peacemaker, right? But <laughs> yet, you know, but yet he did try to make peace with North Korea and he was vilified for that. And the press was so happy when he came back from Vietnam without a peace deal with Korea, right? Um, he tried to be friendly with Russia, was greatly vilified for that. Even I, you know, I was listening to NPR the other day, and they were criticizing him because he talked to Putin about Venezuela, and came back from the meeting believing that maybe he was being misled by people like John Bolton hmm. and Elliot Abrams on that issue. And NPR was, you know, had someone on urging Trump to listen to Bolton and Elliot Abrams on Venezuela. Oh, yeah. You right. know, so mm -hmm. it's very interesting that the, that the liberal attack on Trump with the Russiagate type issues is actually an attack from the right, not from the left, right? And so the, the attempt is to push him, you know, further into confrontation. And that's been successful in, in a large degree, you know? Mm -hmm. He backed out of the, of, uh, of the intermediate range nuclear missile deal with Russia that had been in place since 1987. He has... Uh, you know, largely backed up off from having certainly formal discussions uh, with Russia about various issues. And he's become very warlike with countries like Iran and Venezuela. And I think the whole Russiagate uh, scandal and then things associated with it have really helped move him in those directions, which is certainly regrettable. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's really a godsend, in a sense, to the, the pro-war factions here that, that Trump is so easy to dislike. Um, there's so much about Trump that is that people cannot stand, and so th that gets twisted into uh, being uh, – into opposing Trump when he actually now and then has a good idea, <laughs> such as – Yeah, well, no, that – yeah. 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 No, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, there's that saying a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, and, and, and Trump can be, you know, right once in a while. And again, as you say, he uh, even when he's right, uh, he's attacked, though. It's interesting. Again, it's a certain uh, issues in which he's attacked. And again, it tends to be when he wants to be more peace like. And so. For example, when he bombed Syria after the alleged chemical attack, 
um, people were applauding him as being presidential. There was almost unanimous support for that. When he makes war, that's generally seen as a good thing. Uh, but when he, for example, says we're getting out of Syria, he's attacked for that. So it's very interesting. What you see is really the evidence that there's, uh, you know, amongst our two political parties, there's almost near, near unanimity in support of war. And anyone who deviates from that, including Trump, is attacked. I'm going to sort of bring it to a close, but with my usual last question, which is, um, is there something that you would like to talk about uh, that we haven't covered? Um, something that, that you feel it's important that people think about these days? Well, the one thing that comes to mind, you know, for example, when we talk about Iran, is that Iran is not our enemy. And that may seem like a very radical statement for someone to make. But what people maybe have forgotten if they ever knew it was that right after 9-11, Iran offered to help the U.S. with the war on terror in Afghanistan and against al-Qaeda. And it offered and gave help in both theaters. It helped fight the Taliban. It helped arrest key al-Qaeda leaders. And the Bush administration acknowledged this. And at the time, Iran thought this would be a possibility for a reboot of relations and actually sent to the White House a, um, a document um, saying that, you know, basically every issue the U.S. had with Iran was open for negotiation, that they wanted better relations. And that 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 document was never responded to. And then Bush turned around and gave his axis of evil speech, claiming Iran was some part of some fictitious uh, axis of evil. But the point is we have a lot of things in common with Iran that we could work with uh, on. And instead we turn possible friends into adversaries and into enemies. And that is the real tragedy here. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree with you. I think that's uh, something that's happened. Pretty much all of our enemies are uh, created uh, rather than uh, actually opposing us. But uh, again, thank you very much, Dan, for, uh, for joining me today on the program. Thank you, Charles. Thanks again to Dan Kovalik for speaking with me today. You can find a link to his books and his recent articles in the show notes at widerviewradio.podbean.com. Once again, I must apologize for the sound quality today. I have purchased a new microphone, which will, I hope, resolve the problem and improve the audio quality of Wider View. The views expressed on Wider View are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of the radio station to which you're listening. Our aim is to provoke you to think outside the box and question the narratives you hear from the mainstream media and our national leaders. I hope we have succeeded. Your comments and questions are welcome. Please direct them to WiderViewRadio at gmail.com. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening.